Welcome to the first session of ThinkFest Conversations, which is the digital platform for Afkar Afkar Taza ThinkFest. Now we'll be continuing to hold our physical events in Lahore and other locations in Pakistan, but given the current situation and developments in modern technology, we thought it would be a good idea to take full advantage of these developments and get the benefit of speakers like today's renowned historian, Mr. William Dal Dalrymple. Sorry for butchering your name, Billy. Uh, he is a Scottish historian and also a photographer, the author of 12 books, most recently uh, a book titled The Anarchy, which is about the East India Company. He's written for many magazines, including the New York Review of Books, The New Yorker, The Statesman, and amongst other things, he's also the founder of the Jaipur Lit Fest. So, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that introduction. Could we have the, the PowerPoint, please? And on to the first slide. We could have the first slide, which is that crenellated castle rising, that one. Yeah, brilliant. Mm -hmm. So, um, one of the very first Hindustani or Urdu words to enter the English language uh, was, of course, the word loot, uh, derived from the uh, Urdu lutna, to plunder. Uh, and if you want to understand how, why and how uh, that particular word uh, gained such uh, rapid traction in 18th century England and how this word previously unheard outside the plains of, the, of North India and the Punjab uh, suddenly became common throughout the British Isles in the 18th century, you need go no further than this lovely crenellated uh, bastion uh, in, on the PowerPoint in front of us. This is Powys Castle, um, uh, into which uh, the loot of the Clive family uh, was funneled in the 18th century. It was originally the, uh, the house of the Herbert family, and uh, the Clives, in the classic way, new money, married old land, uh, uh, the, the famous transaction, and the very uh, beautiful and rich Clive heiress married a rather dim uh, but well housed Herbert heir uh, and the two um, uh, came together Clive collection and Powys and when you go inside uh, next slide uh, you can find sitting in the Welsh countryside a better collection of um, Mughal loot than is available in any public collection in either India or Pakistan or Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or Afghanistan uh, or anywhere else. Um, there is room after room of uh, magnificent uh, uh, Mughal armor, shields, ivory chessmen, uh, pagris, um, chogas, uh, wonderful mogul robes, elephant armor, uh, and one or two quite major items, uh, next slide, uh, of, uh, uh, of a really major importance, such as this, which is the palanquin of Siraj Daula, the Nawab of Murshidabad, left on the battlefield of Plassey. Uh, and if you go through the arch at the end of the slide, uh, you end up in Tipu Sultan's battle tent, all now sitting in the Welsh countryside. Now, how did it, this happen? How on earth did you, do you find um, uh, the, all this loot sitting in the middle uh, of, uh, of Great Britain? The answer, of course, next slide, uh, is, the, uh, uh, is this transaction that took place uh, after the Battle of Buxa. And there we have, you can see, a, uh, a, a mogul prince in cloth of gold handing a document to a, a powdered and periwig Georgian gentleman. And this is Shah Alam, as the, as the caption says, conveying the Diwani to uh, Lord Clive. Now, uh, the Diwani doesn't really mean much to anyone in India or Pakistan today. Uh, what it means in modern English, really, is it hands over financial control of what was then the three richest districts of the Mughal Empire, which was Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, uh, not to the British government, as nationalist historiography has it in both Pakistan and India, 
Uh, but instead, what is often forgotten, uh, next slide, uh, it was handed over to a multinational corporation based in this building in front of us. And uh, it's not even the two buildings on either side. It's just the five windows in the middle. And this is one of the most strange and improbable moments in all South Asian history. Because South Asia, at its richest, uh, at the, at the uh, uh, apogee, uh, the economic apogee, uh, if not the political apogee, of the Mughal Empire, at a point when the Mughals are making about 40% of the world's goods, 40% of the manufactured goods in the world are being made in Mughal India. And yet at this very moment, one finds one English company from a country which only controlled about 5% of world trade at this moment. Uh, and not even the whole country, this is just one company in one street, in one building, in one town, London, the East India Company, sitting in this building. At this point, fewer than 35 people working in that office in Leadenhall Street. Uh, and yet, these 35 people out of this office managed to pull off this incredible coup of piece by piece, conquering the fragmented remains of the Mughal Empire in the 18th century, so that by the end of the 18th century, the, the East India Company, still out of this one building, controls almost all of Mughal South Asia. There's still the Punjab, there's still basically Pakistan to conquer. Uh, by, uh, by the end of the 18th century, the, Mughal, the, the East India Company had really got as far as sort of Delhi and Haryana, and Haryana. Uh, but they haven't crossed the Sutlej uh, or the Indus into what's now Pakistan. That comes with the Sikh Wars uh, in the late 18, uh, seven, uh, sorry, the late 1830s and 1840s, uh, that uh, what is now Pakistan is absorbed into the company's territories. But uh, they haven't done badly. By, by 1800, this one English company is English, uh, controlled out of London, its official title is the is the uh, uh, the Company of London Merchants trading with the East Indies. Uh, this company controls most of South Asia. How does it begin? For that, we have to go to the next slide with this man, Thomas Smythe. Um, and um, can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. So Thomas Smythe in this slide is the equivalent of um, uh, uh, that's right, uh, Thomas Smythe, uh, sitting uh, in his ruff, is the equivalent of, I suppose, Vijay Malia uh, or Benazir Bhutto's husband, a cross between a man uh, with uh, dodgy business interests and uh, fondness for meddling in politics. And like Vijay Malia, the Kingfisher, uh, Thomas Smythe inherited a fortune from his father which he used to great effect. He, he founded the Levant Company, trading spices and currants out of the Greek islands and the Ottoman Empire. But uh, he then um, found something much more ambitious. Uh, in 1599, in response to the um, Dutch who have sailed around the Cape and are now importing spices uh, directly from Kerala and from Indonesia, um, he founds a new company. And next slide, what is uh, dramatically new about this company is it's open to public subscription. Uh, at the first subscriber list is the next slide, if we could have that, sir. You'll find the... Uh, this is the list of the very first people who turned up on the 22nd of September, 1599, and invested their money in the East India Company. You can see that the names, you can see the numbers, 200 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 200 pounds, the very first investors. And they come to a public meeting in Moorgate Fields, that's called by the company. And this is a relatively, not quite brand new, but this is a, a new sort of business. Um, the earliest joint stock company was the Muscovy Company, founded about 40 years earlier in London to trade, to gather capital, to trade with um, Moscow and the Russians. Uh, and uh, two or three other companies have been formed since, but this is, I think, the fifth 
ever joint stock company. And where, what separates it from earlier companies like the Medici Bank or the Marco Polo's trading with China or any of the previous business models in the West is that anyone can invest in it. They don't have to play a part in the business. Uh, they just give their capital and in return they get a share of the profits. And it's a very obvious thing today. Most people in the world work for companies uh, uh, of this sort today. Uh, in 1599, it was a radically new business model. Uh, most other companies were family businesses owned by an individual or a family, uh, like the Medici's or the Marco Polo's in, in, in Italy. And um, so the joint, the, the joint stock company allowed you to accumulate much larger sums of money. And very quickly, the East India Company gathers enough money. Next slide to get to hire the services of Sir James Lanchester, who's this. Uh, handsome character here, also in a rough with his fingers on a globe. And uh, Lancaster had just come back from a failed expedition to the East Indies, but he had at least been there. He got there uh, and made it to the East Indies, but had, uh, sunk his ship on the top left of the slide on the way back. Nonetheless, he was probably the best bet in London because no one else had been to this territory. And they go off and they go to a harbour at Deptford to find some shipping. They reject a creaky old hulk called the Mayflower, which they deem unseaworthy, uh, and buy instead a, a ship uh, called, it sounds like it's some Jack Sparrow's ship from Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, a ship called the Scourge of Malice. And, the, and even the, the slightly goofish East India Company captain, Sir James Axis, is realizes this is not a good name for a new trading company. So he changes uh, the Scourge of Malice, which literally was a pirate ship, um, to the Red Dragon, that sounds slightly less aggressive. And they gather all their, their hogsheads of, of water and wine and beer and supplies, and off they sail, and they go around the Cape of Good Hope. They arrive in Indonesia, and just as they're about to arrive, um, they find a Portuguese ship coming in the opposite direction, um, which they duly board, as most of the crew are pirates. And they didn't even have to trade in Indonesia. They just bought the Portuguese uh, uh, carrack, transfer the contents into their own hold, and sail home again, and sell the spices for one million pounds. And this is enough money to fund the company for the next few years. Um, in the 1640s, there's a change of business model because the Dutch are, are doing rather better than the English at trading spices. And in the end, the, uh, the English decide to hand over the spice fields of Indonesia to the Dutch. There's a treaty. The, uh, the English get in return Manhattan, which at the, uh, at the time seemed like not a very good deal, but obviously in the, in the fullness of time, it was rather a bit of a stroke of genius. Um, and in the 1640s, they changed basically to becoming a textile trading company, rather like a, a modern startup, which has got it slightly wrong. They, they slightly changed their business model and their logo and so on. And in 1640, they focus on where the main textile emporiums are, and that isn't Indonesia, that is India, particularly Bengal. In Bengal, there are a million weavers weaving um, spectacular cotton, silks, kalamkaris, all this sort of fancy textile stuff is being made uh, in great quantity uh, in, um, uh, in uh, Bengal. And the East India Company basically makes its fortune shipping this stuff around the globe. Next slide. Um, and this is East India Company House, which they buy uh, as their center of operations. It all goes very well until next slide, Aurangzeb screws up. Uh, oh no, this is not uh, Aurangzeb, this is Deptford. This is them building their ships. But next slide is Aurangzeb. And uh, Aurangzeb, um, by over expanding the Mughal Empire, um, begins the crack up. Uh, the Marathas erupt out of the western hills, uh, the Jats erupt in, the, in Haryana the, and, and, and the Doab, the Sikhs rise up in, in, in rebellion in the Punjab, and the whole thing's looking a bit shaky. Nonetheless, in the middle, here is Delhi, next slide, uh, still the richest and largest city in the world, uh, with Lahore coming a pretty good second. Um, here is the Red Fort, next slide, Chani Chauk. And everyone wonders, is it going to be the Marathas? Is it going to be the Jats? Is it going to be the Sikhs that gets to loot this incredible empire? But it's none of those. Next slide, it's actually uh, this uh, uh, character, Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah, a wild card, um, self-made man, son of a furrier from Herat, 
now in Afghanistan, rises to the head of the, of the Safavid uh, army, performs a sort of Ayub Khan or Zia-style military coup or Musharraf-style military coup, takes over the country, uh, and uh, then needs more cash, uh, as military dictators often do. Uh, and uh, he goes and he needs cash, in this case, to fight the Russians and the Ottomans, who are his enemy. And he realizes his easiest source of cash is India. So he decides to invade Mughal India, not to take it over. He has no intention of taking over the Mughal Empire. He just wants to loot it. So in he goes. He fights the Battle of Karnal in 1739. Next slide, uh, which he wins, defeats the rather hopeless Muhammad Shah Rangila, and then marches into Delhi, loots it, and runs off with the Koh i Noor, the peacock throne. 800 wagons of loot rumble through the Punjab, through Lahore, back to uh, his uh, Turkmen base in Herat, and uh, leaving the Mughals completely broke. They've got no money to pay the army, the civil service, uh, and uh, the Mughal Empire simply fragments. Without the money to pay the civil service or the army, there's nothing holding it together. And what had been one huge empire with an army of four million men under arms instead becomes a fragmented patchwork. As if you've taken a mirror and thrown it out of a three story, third story window, smashes into a million bits. Every Rajput state, Jodhpur, Jaipur, Bahawalpur, uh, all the hill states, the Tad, uh, uh, Tanjore, I mean, the Marathas, everything becomes sort of self-governing. And... In terms of culture, this is a great moment for South Asian art and architecture and music, Hindustani music, Mughal, uh, sorry, Bihari miniatures, Sikh miniatures, uh, Rajput architecture, all these things have their heyday. But as far as defense and military matters are concerned, it's a catastrophe. And uh, the people who sweep up all this lot are not the Marathas or the Tipu or any of the other contenders. Next slide it is the, the French and the English. And the French are the first to introduce Western 18th century military technology and, and infantry training. Here are the sepoys. Uh, only the French would dress up um, uh, their troops in little sort of Vogue shorts. It looks like a sort of gay pride parade, but it is in fact the cutting edge military technology of its day. And the English East India Company copies this. And uh, the first time that it really shows what uh, what, what has changed, how dramatically the military revolution has taken place, is when next slide Siraj Dowler invades Calcutta. Uh, he has a successful uh, conquest of Calcutta, but the next uh, month uh, he has a visit from next slide, uh, a man who will prove his nemesis, Robert Clive, a young military genius, an aggressive little punk really. I mean, he's kind of a mafiosi rather than any great military hero. I've uh, been running protection rackets and market Drayton and the like. Um, and uh, the Battle of Plassey, next slide, which is uh, normally shown to be a great military victory uh, of British arms, was in fact a stitch up. Next slide, uh, both Clive and this character, Mir Jaffa, who was the main general on the Mughal side, on, on Siraj Dawla's army, uh, were both in the pay of the same uh, Mawari bankers, the Jagat Sets, uh, who had been insulted by Siraj Dawla and wanted to effect regime change. And they pay Clive four million pounds, two to him, two to the company, uh, to uh, get rid of Siraj Dawla, which they, he duly does. And he walks into the treasury in Mashidabad and simply helps himself. When he's called before parliament to explain himself slightly later, um, he just says, uh, my lords, I was astonished at my own moderation. Uh, and uh, uh, shortly afterwards, uh, there is another battle in 1764. There's the Battle of Buxar, uh, whereupon the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam and the Nawab of Avad, Shujo Daula, this giant who is running luck now, are both defeated. Next slide. Here is uh, Shah Alam lying on the divan after his defeat, uh, sitting in Allahabad, uh, taking orders from this company uh, general, General Barker. Uh, and uh, suddenly the, the company realizes that with these two victories, Plassey and Buxa, in seven years, that the whole of North India is theirs. There's no army uh, to stop them doing what they like. 
What do they do, therefore? They simply do what any big multinational does if it's not being regulated or being looked after. It asset strips. Uh, and, it, and it just, there's this period of about 10 years when the company just reduces Bengal from this spectacularly rich state to this basket case with, with uh, bones bleaching in the wind. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the, they pay, the karma comes because there's a terrible famine in 1770, 5 million Bengalis die. And the company suddenly realizes that it's, um, it sort of killed the goose that laid the golden egg. It, they plundered Bengal so badly, there's no profits anymore. And at that point, the company nearly goes bust and has to be bailed out by the British government. It's rather like the subprime uh, collapse of, of 10 years ago. Uh, uh, all the companies suddenly have to appeal to the government for money, including the company. And this is the first moment that the British government gets involved. This is now 1774. Up to this point, we've seen unrestrained libertarian capitalism uh, of the company with absolutely no government control. All the company has to do is pay tax and customs, and the British government lets it get on and do what it likes. But from this point, the company has a measure of government control and oversight which grows so that increasingly from the end of the 18th century, from 1774, the bailout uh, through to when it's finally rolled up in 1857, you get increasing government control of the East India Company. Um, but the company now is, is you know, unstoppable. Uh, once it's bailed out and has been recapitalized, uh, its army is simply growing uh, larger and larger until there's no one who can, um, uh, uh, take it on. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, the East India Company, next slide, has grown from this rather small army, next slide, uh, of about 40,000 at the time of Buxa, to this army by 1799. Uh, this picture of Yalapa of the law shows the uniforms of, of, of 1799. Uh, and uh, these guys are 200,000 strong. And these are not the troops of the British government. It's a very important point. This is not a British government uh, 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 army. Uh, it, it, there are British army regiments in India, a few, uh, not many, uh, a few British army troops, but this is the, uh, the private force of the East India Company. This is a private army, rather like the guards of G4S or sometimes Shell in Nigeria have their own security force guarding their oil fields, for example. Uh, this is of that nature. It's a private army run by the company to protect their assets. And this army is the largest modern army in Asia. And, and in 1799, they defeat the Sultan. In 1803, they defeat the Marathas and are now the prime um, supreme power in Asia. They've really replaced the Mughals. 1803, they march into the Red Fort and, uh, and put Shah Alam uh, back on the throne as their protector. And by this point, next slide, company tax collectors like James Todd on his elephant here uh, have fanned out across the country, assessing land, pulling in land revenue. And increasingly, the income from the company is arriving as much from land revenue as it is from trade. By this point, they're planting opium in Bihar and Bengal, which they're selling in the largest narco operation in history uh, in China. And... Uh, the uh, opium wars are fought in the 1840s to defend that trade. It makes the Medellin cartel and Pablo Escobar look like uh, a bunch of nuns having a school picnic. Uh, uh, they are, it's a huge and hugely profitable business. And with the profits of the opium, they're buying tea, which they're selling around the world, not least, next slide, uh, to the Americas. Next slide. And this is the Boston Tea Party. This is the East India Company tea. No back. Back a slide, sorry, we want the, we want the picture of the ship. Uh, yes, the, uh, that is East India Company tea being poured into Boston Harbor. And by this stage, as you can see from this, the East India Company has moved from that one office in Leaden Hall Street to become the world's largest capitalist organization, literally straddling the globe. Uh, uh, based in Leaden Hall Street, still in London, but with uh, now controlling the whole of South Asia uh, and um, uh, with operations stretching from there to China and America. By this stage, uh, they have their own flag, next slide, uh, which is the model for the American flag when the American colonies uh, later break off. Uh, and their Leadenhall Street um, 
Headquarters, next slide, is now the size of Buckingham Palace. Uh, the director's boardroom, next slide, is the place where uh, uh, India and Pakistan and Burma and Sri Lanka are all controlled from. Uh, next slide, they have their own uh, harbors and their own ship uh, yards in East India Dock, uh, which are producing about 300 ships a year to sail this opium around the globe. Next slide. Um, this is the, the Brunswick Dock where more ships are being made. It's a huge, massive operation. And it all gets more and more profitable and gets, gets more and more powerful until 1857 when there's the Great Uprising. Their own sepoys, their own private security force rebel against them. And such is the death toll. Next slide. Uh, here is the troops going into Kashmiri Gate in Delhi in September 1857. Here is the aftermath, the hanging of the rebels that follows. And about, you know, there are no real figures, but it's probably in the high hundreds of thousands. Uh, the casualties. And this is such a mess that the British government at this point intervenes. Next slide. And the East India Company is rolled up. Here's the punch cartoon. Back slide, back to the cartoon. Uh, the punch cartoon, uh, punch cartoon says, uh, shows the East India Company being uh, headquarters in Leadenhall Street being blown from the mouth of a cannon. Nepotism, blundering, avarice, and misgovernment are the captions as East India Company House goes up. It's rolled up in 1858 with less fanfare than, a, uh, a, than a, a regional railway bankruptcy, says, uh, says one uh, uh, newspaper. Um, and the Raj begins. But what's interesting is that the Raj only really lasts 90 years. We hear all, this, uh, all these TV dramas and so on about Raj this and Raj that, but the Raj only lasts from 1858 to 1947. Uh, when India and Pakistan emerge as, as, as uh, independent countries. Um, it's 90 years, the Raj, while the East India Company is around for 250 years, from you know, 1599 to 1858. Uh, and it's kind of forgotten. The Victorians were embarrassed by the commercial origins of their empire, and they kind of rooted out of history. Uh, but I think in our own time, when we have all these incredibly powerful multinationals, it's very important to remember that India was conquered not by the British, per se, but by a corporation. The final slide here is Warren Hastings. Uh, and the trial of Warren Hastings is a very important moment in history because it's the one time that, that the parliament, which previously has been bribed by the East India Company, uh, the first ever case of a multinational corporation lobbying with financial inducements and being caught offering money to parliament something which obviously has happened many times around the globe since, uh, is in 1695 when the company's caught being offered a bung, uh, offering a bung to MPs to extend its monopoly. And eventually Parliament impeaches Warren Hastings. In fact, they've got the wrong guy. Warren Hastings actually is one of the more honest of the company officials and, uh, and the least uh, awful of these guys. Um, but a very important trial. And I'll just end before handing over to you. Um, with the quote of the Lord Chancellor when they, uh, uh, when they take him for trial. And uh, the trial is opened with, with the Lord Chancellor saying, corporations have neither bodies, uh, so neither have souls to be condemned, nor bodies to be punished. Uh, they therefore do as they like. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Willie, for that fabulous overview of your book. And I think anybody even though so many people have read your book, I think even those who haven't will be, uh, you know, will get a real summary and a you know, concise introduction to everything that is in there. Um, the, one of the questions which um, is raised, not only in a review that I read somewhere, but is also raised by one of our um, colleagues, uh, Hussein Anwar, he talks about the title, The Anarchy. And the question really is, what is this anarchy that you're referring to? Because uh, is it the, are you saying that the East India Company caused the anarchy? Because as the review pointed out, the anarchy was there from before. The East India Company only profited from it. So the anarchy is a reference to the, the, the post-Mughal chaos, uh, what happens uh, when the Mughal Empire collapses. Uh, and uh, this was the term used in Persian, uh, in Hindustani, in French, and in English at the time. It's one that's fallen out of favor because for the last 50 years there's been this, uh, this emphasis rightly on the fact that 
the late 18th century, as well as being the end of the Mughal Empire and the crack up of this great centralized state, is also the period when a lot of the institutions uh, of, of modern South Asia are born. It's a period of enormous innovation. You get Hyderabad, Lucknow, uh, the, the great uh, uh, Renaissance in art and architecture and so on. Uh, and uh, historians, really since the time of Chris Bailey uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 1980s, have been very busy saying this wasn't a dark age, that this was in fact a period when a lot of modern South Asia's uh, institutions have their birth. Um, but I think in a sense, the pendulum's gone too far. We've forgotten quite what a mess uh, North India was uh, at this time. And uh, that's the reference. It is also uh, implicitly a reference to the fact that the East India Company waded into this anarchy and made it worse, uh, uh, looting and pillaging and, and, and uh, uh, extracting the profits and, and, and uh, loot of South Asia and shipping it home to build all the lovely country houses that when uh, your, uh, your lovely Pakistani um, uh, tourists go off, to, um, uh, go off to London for their summer holidays as the heat hits 42 in Lahore, uh, they, uh, they go to visit these nice uh, Georgian houses dotted around the English countryside that look as if Mr. Darcy is about to uh, step out in, the, uh, in, in his uh, ruffled shirt and, and peach breeches from a, some BBC costume drama. Uh, and uh, of course, a lot of these houses are built by return nabobs, nabobs being an English corruption of Nawab. Um, and uh, these, these guys come home with considerable fortunes, the richest of them you know, often ship back one to 15 million pounds. Now to put that in context, the entire rental of the largest landowner in Scotland in this period is, is uh, uh, at the annual total take of all his uh, estates and rentals is 6,000 wow. pounds. And these people are shipping back one million pounds to, uh, 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 to uh, uh, England at the end of their career. Uh, and draining that enormous sums of money from uh, from South Asia, unlike the Mughals who looted to their heart's content and you know and merrily and, and viciously, uh, but nonetheless you know spent the money in South Asia um, when they you know raided the Marathas or, 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 or did a uh, uh, destroyed the Deccan Sultanates or something you know when they loot, looted Golconda they took the money uh, from Golconda and spent it in Rajasthan or in Delhi. Um, but the British take the money and they spend it in Powers Castle, and, uh, and uh, uh, as well as shipping many of the nicest diamonds and things home with. Um, you mentioned that one of the points uh, after 1857 was that the Victorians were embarrassed by sort of the commercial origins of empire, and perhaps sought to rewrite history. And you know, in that sense, perhaps your book is an antidote to that sort of uh, effort. But one of the criticisms which has been raised in a, in, in a review, I'm sure you must have read, is a professor at Stanford called Priya Satya, and also the noted ice by ice a reader ice. called Abraham Murad. She makes, in effect, the same Victorian argument. She agrees with the Victorian thing. She says everything, in effect, that what she says is it's not just a few bad men, that what the company was doing there was it was acting as an agent of state, and that you can read, you know, sort of the... There's the shadow of empire and what the company was doing. It's not just the, it's not just the, uh, you know, the desire to make money. How would you respond to that? Well, I, it's as as the book says, it's increasingly true after the government um, becomes, uh, you know, gets its claws into the company after its bankruptcy in 1774. And from that point, you have increasing government control. And, and by the time, you know, Warren Hastings appointed in 1780 is, 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 is a political appointment. He's, he's an East India Company man, but he's appointed, he's the first of the appointments made by the government. And thereafter, you get other governor generals such as Lord Wellesley who have nothing to do with the company at all. They're, they're political appointees, rather like Trump appointing ambassadors over the heads of the State Department. These, you know, the, the government sends out to India over the heads of the East India Company uh, the, the, a succession of governor generals who, who will do their will. So it's certainly true that from the late 18th century and the first half of the 19th century, that yes, it is a quasi-governmental 
organization, what we, I suppose, today would call a public-private partnership. But that's absolutely not true before 1774, which is something that MPs get very exercised about. Uh, and uh, there is, you know, the, 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 the MPs of Britain um, take the view that it's scandalous that uh, a colony should be, should be being run by, uh, uh, by a private capitalist enterprise. Uh, and they say that, you know, like uh, other colonies, such as uh, the United States or Australia, it should be governed directly by the Crown. So I, I'm, uh, I was slightly baffled by that review because um, you know, a, a good uh, Stanford professor should know better. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, uh, it was very much a, a, a government, uh, I mean, a, a government-free zone. Um, and what you find on the contrary, which is really interesting, I think, is that not only is the government not telling the East India Company what to do, in many cases, the company is telling the government what to do, uh, sometimes by bribery and corruption, as with a modern lobbying group like Exxon Mobil, you know, who to this, at this very moment employ 40 ex-American congressmen, 20 Democrats and 20 Republicans to do their lobbying for them in Capitol Hill. But beyond that, actually directly handing money and share options to MPs if they vote for it to extend its monopoly. That's when they first get caught in 1695. Uh, and moreover, you then get things like, you know, ex-nabobs coming back, buying large houses, and then buying parliamentary seats. This is the days of the rotten boroughs. So that you get huge chunks of parliament that's actually controlled by individual East India Company men. And um, so either directly with returned East India Company people entering parliament, as Clive, for example, did, or indirectly uh, through bribery of other MPs and, uh, and the purchase of seats. Um, not only is the government not telling the company what to do, the company is telling the government what to do. Um, one of the questions that I had, and I think you mentioned this as well, is that when the British first you know, were becoming successful in, in Bengal, perhaps they were benefiting from their technological superiority or in terms of their um, how they were developing you know, military forces. But I recall you making the point that after a while, it wasn't just, there wasn't really a military superiority, it was more a question of discipline. And is that really, I mean, it's difficult to read his, you know, le take lessons from there, but if you were to tell people, or you know, let's say if you were talking to government people, is this something that you would tell them? Look, you know, you need discipline. I mean, is that a fair uh, analysis or what? So yes, the, when the, there is a military revolution that takes place in Europe in the first half of the 18th century. You have Frederick the Great uh, fighting the, uh, the war of the Austrian succession. He basically invents new infantry techniques that take the world by storm for a century. Um, the file firing, you, know, you see it in you know, all those 18th century movies like Last Mohicans when one line kneel down, fire their muskets, then... Um, uh, then people fire a second line of muskets uh, behind them while they're loading. Uh, that file firing, uh, the fixed bayonet uh, is an invention of, of Frederick the Great. Horse artillery being driven around the battlefield, uh, shells, ballistics, so on. So you have, you have this whole new way of fighting a war. And that's imported into India in about 1740s. First time there's a battle called the Battle of the Adyar River when the French East India Company defeat the Nawab of the Carnatic's troops. And from that point, there's a little window of about 40 years when the company defeats every Indian army through technological superiority. And uh, that's what wins Bassey, that's what wins Boxer. But by the 1780 or so, both the Marathas and Tipu have caught up. And in 1779, you get a major defeat of the company by uh, the Marathas, uh, a Bombay army going up the guts, is ambushed and, and destroyed by the Marathas. Then the following year, Tibu Sultan defeats an, another company army at Polilo outside Madras. And suddenly you have the, you know, the, the realization, the terrible realization for the company that the Indians who they've so easily defeated with their technology have now caught up, that they've got the same guns, the same techniques, the same drill. They've been taught by the French how to do it. It's not rocket science. Anyone can do it. Uh, if a bunch of Scots Highlanders can be trained to do it, some brilliant Tam Brams can certainly be trained to do it too. So uh, uh, how 
between 1780 and uh, 1840, uh, does the company manage to defeat the Marathas, Tipu Sultan, and then the Sikhs? The answer is resources. Um, the company is a company. It understands balance sheets, it understands repaying loans, it understands the importance of, of being credit worthy. And basically, India's bankers back the company rather than Tipu or the Marathas. At the end of the day, the bankers know that they're going to get their money back if they lend it to the company. Uh, and so the Mawari bankers of Calcutta were incredibly powerful. Um, uh, they initially got Clive on board with the Jagat Set family in 1756. Other bankers like Gopal Das and, uh, and so on in, in Patna and, and Illahabad continued to lend all the way through the Maratha wars. And the company could simply afford more troops, better troops. They get the pick of the sepoys because they pay double what Tipu is paying. They, ha they can afford twice as many muskets, twice as many cannon, uh, and they just got the money to run an expensive army, a huge and expensive army. Uh, and that's what, in the end, gives them the edge over to the Marathas and ultimately the Sikhs. Okay, if I could just shift away from the anarchy and just ask you a couple of more background questions because we don't want to make this too long. Your first few books were more uh, part history, part, part travelogue, and, you know, I read you know, uh, in Xanadu from the Holy Mountain and then a book about Delhi. Do you ever think of going back to writing something lighter like that or are you planning to continue in sort of a, you know, the more sort of, you know, I'd say... Well, I'm very glad that I, I wasn't planning to because with, with COVID-19, I think the age of the travel book is definitely gone for the next few years. Uh, but now I'm very glad to say I wasn't planning to do that. I, I, I'm now gone back to this uh, ancient India and the whole uh, story of, um, uh, of how Indic ideas uh, spread out in the early centuries. So how is it that one Indian idea, Buddhism, travels up through Pakistan, through Gandhara, through Afghanistan and Bamiyan, and becomes the state religion of China? How is it that other Indic religions, Hinduism, Vaishnavism, Shaivism, take over Southeast Asia and you get the biggest Hindu temple of the world being built, not in India, but in Angkor Wat. Uh, and then how is it that ancient Indian mathematics ends up um, coming through uh, Sindh, uh, uh, past modern Karachi, and ed heading to Abbasid Baghdad, where the Indian numeral system, uh, the decimal system, and um, uh, the, uh, uh, the Indian symbols for numbers are taken up first by the Arabs and then um, exported by Fibonacci to, who, who understands Arabic who grew up in Algeria and Fibonacci brings them to Europe and popularizes them in Europe so uh, uh, and uh, algorithm uh, this, this, uh, which is what we're using at this very moment to talk to each other the, uh, the algorithm is named after al Khwarizmi who came from Khwarazm, which is, where, which is the, the basis of the word algorithm. And uh, his famous book was The Mathematics of India. Uh, 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 and he writes this, uh, uh, this extraordinary book, which basically brings the idea of the decimal system, of trigonometry, of algebra, uh, uh, the sine function particularly, and um, the idea of place value. In other words, you know, having different columns for uh, single units, tens, hundreds, thousands, which means that just 10 symbols can be used to, uh, uh, to uh, represent any number up to infinity. Um, uh, these, are all, these are all Indian innovations that, uh, that spread out across, across the world. And it happens, in, 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 it's, very, it's a very short period. It's, it's a period in the kind of 6th and 7th century when a lot of this happens. Buddhism becomes the state religion of China in the seventh century, the Tang dynasty under this amazing empress, Wu Zetian. Uh, Jayavarman II is building Angkor Wat at the same time. And uh, it's a little bit later. Uh, and uh, uh, Fibonacci is, uh, is, is, the, is the 12th century. So between about 800 and 1200, all these Indian ideas take over the world, rather like Greek ideas took over uh, Europe. Which, you know, I grew up in, uh, in Scotland, surrounded by Palladian buildings based on the, the Hellenic model. Um, and why, how, you know, how did those 
Greek ideas reach Scotland. It wasn't by conquest. It wasn't that the Greeks came and uh, set up a Greek East India Company in, in, in Edinburgh. It was the, the power of those ideas. And the same is true in Asia with Indic ideas. And, and so that's, that's my next thing. Slightly different. I, I've, been, I've done four Mughal East India Company books, and, and so now I'm, uh, I'm uh, doing something slightly different. I'm, I mean, I, I, part of the reason this is I love all, the, all your amazing Gandharan sculpture in, in Pakistan. And my last thing before I locked down was a wonderful trip to see the newly renovated Peshawar Museum and, uh, and, uh, and, and my old favorite, the Hall Museum. Uh, which I think is going to have to keep me busy uh, in terms of traveling for the next few months because I don't get anywhere else. Oh, I have one final query and it's actually a point noted by my mother who's uh, 81 and reads your books with uh, sort of uh, great interest. And Send to my Thank you. Um, she said, well, you know, in his earlier books, he always used to make the point that he was Scottish and he used to take digs at the English and he no longer does that. So I said I'll pass oh, their observation no. on. Now I'm still very Scottish, and uh, there's lots of Scots in the anarchy. Uh, in fact, there's, there's probably more Scots than English there. Certainly, all the heroes are Scots. So, uh, no, no, I'm absolutely. still I'm still a card-carrying Scot, and, and still very much taking digs at the the Sassanacs. Well, that's good to know. Before we well, sign off, I'd just like to say how sorry I am to hear about this crash today and uh, I'm sure many people will be listening to this will know people who, who, who've suffered in that crash and, and it's a very tragic moment for, for, for everyone not just for Pakistan. It's a terrible tragedy you know the families are traveling for Eid and you know there's so many people tonight will be you know uh, mourning instead of looking forward to what is normally a very joyous holiday so thank you for your kind words and you know, we all uh, share in that pain. It's good to know that people everywhere acknowledge that and, and feel that as well. But thank you so much for being such a fabulous guest and for, you know, you know, teaching us all so much. And thank you for being the first sort of, of in these Think Fest conversations. And we hope to keep them up with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.